do appreciate you being here. The remembering our gospel meeting that's coming up, up October 5th through the 10th. I'm making plans to be here then, inviting others to come. Remember our door knocking on October 4th, the day before our meeting begins, and come and be with us and help uh, knock doors and invite people to come. Uh, But um, we always know that the best is to get those that we have contact with personally, that we have some influence over, and inviting them to come and uh, studying the Bible with us. Uh, So be making plans for that. Uh, I'll mention, uh, even though it was on the board, that Karen's dad is in the hospital in Denison, Texas. Uh, I think it just is honoriness is catching up with him. Uh, but uh, it was a possible stroke. They're not sure exactly uh, what it is, So, uh, but uh, he went in last night, so appreciate your prayers on his behalf as well. This morning I want to start a lesson dealing with the calling of God. And in Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse 1, Paul begins this chapter by saying, Therefore, or I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Some of the later translations, instead of using the word vocation there, use the word calling. And actually the root word that's found in the word vocation and the word called are the same word, and it would be rightly translated, the walk worthy of the calling wherewith you're called. We have a calling, and we are to walk worthy of that calling. But we do have a charge here to walk worthy of it. Um, there's a worthiness to that calling that we have. And we're to live in such a way that we live up to the standard that it, that it uh, has set for us. But this calling is a divine calling. It comes from God. In Hebrews 3 and verse 1, the Hebrews writer would say, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling." Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Partakers of the heavenly calling. The idea of a heavenly calling is that it is a calling from God as a result. And it tells us that we are partakers of that heavenly calling. We are in fellowship with it. Uh, We have taken part of it the calling that comes from God. And then he tells us to consider, to think carefully concerning, to look into and scrutinize the apostle and high priest of our profession, uh, Christ Jesus. Uh, Just as a note, uh, the term apostle as used here and in relationship with the 12 apostles, deals with, and the word means one cent. Uh, And as the Bible often does, it takes common terms and makes spiritual applications with that term. Uh, Term elder is a term likened to that. A term elder in its general usage, it simply meant someone who was older. But then the Bible takes that term and uses it in a specialized way that dealing with the office of the eldership. You see the same principle in relationship to the term apostle. 
we have an apostle, one sent. If I should this afternoon uh, during the Cowboys game that's going to be played, say, Andrew, go to the grocery store down here or Tom Thumb and get me a cup of coffee. Now, since it was during the Cowboys game, he would probably say no. <laughs> but if he went and got me a cup of coffee, he would be my apostle. And the fact that I sent him to do that. That's a general use in the way in which it was generally used in the first century. But then we take that term and we say specialized use in the Bible. And thus when we talk about the apostles, we're talking about those 12 men, and then later Matthias, and then taking the part of Judas, and then later on Paul, they were the apostles of Jesus Christ and that they were ones who were sent by him. Well, now then, that term apostle is being used in relationship to Jesus Christ and it is stating that someone sent Jesus Christ. He is that one who has been sent. Well, the one who sent him within the book of Hebrews shows us that it is the Father who sent Jesus into this world. And thus, you consider Jesus, the apostle, but he also says he's the high priest of our profession. And we are to consider carefully that. But, we go back to that, we have been a partaker of that heavenly calling. And thus, it is a calling that comes from God. And 2 Timothy, the first chapter in verse 9, Paul tells Timothy, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And so he's talking about God here. God saved us. God is the one who gave us Christ Jesus. And notice that's before the world began. He gave us Christ Jesus. And so before the world even began, God had planned the salvation of a man through Jesus Christ. And God then, in the working of time, sent his only begotten son into this world to carry out that salvation of man. And thus, here's his own purpose and grace that he has demonstrated toward us. But now then, with that understanding, it's talking about God the Father. He saved us and called us. In other words, God the Father called us with a holy calling. But he called us. We have a calling that comes from God. In Philippians, the third chapter, in verse 14. Paul in his own life, and if you go to the verses preceding this, he shows here's the things that were of importance to me in my life, but I count them but dung that I may win Christ. And now then he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here's that high calling of God. It's God's call. And it's a calling that each and every one of us have. It's a calling that is given to every person to the gospel of Jesus Christ. To obey that gospel. And we'll look at that a little bit more as we go on in this study. But it is a calling that comes from God. It is a divine calling. But also we are instructed that we are to make that calling and election sure so that we can have an eternal home with God in heaven. In Second Peter, the first chapter, verse 10 and verse 11, it would state, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. 
For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here we are to make our calling and election sure. How are we going to do that? By doing these things, he says. Well, what are these things? Well, in the preceding verses, verses 5 through 7, he gives what is we generally term the Christian graces. That we are to add to our faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, temperance to temperance, patience to patience, godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness and the brotherly kindness, charity or love. And he says, if these things be in you, if you add these things to your life, you're living in that abundant type of lifestyle, then ye shall never fall. Does that mean that we have the doctrine of once saved, always saved? Well, obviously not, because there's condition there. If you do these things, what if you don't do those things? Well, if you become a Christian, but you don't add those Christian graces to your life, then you will fall. That's the result of not adding those Christian graces. But when you add the Christian graces to your life, you will not fall. And what's the end result? Here is an eternal entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's dealing with heaven now. And so here's this calling that comes from God that we have. We are to make it sure how by adding the Christian graces to our lives. And if you go back into verse 3 and verse 4, it shows how that we take God's word and through God's word we can have a knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that we don't live according to the lust of this world. But we have escaped that by, adding, by being partakers of the divine nature. And thus we escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. What is that? That's making our calling and election sure so that we can have that eternal home with God in heaven. And so with that as a background, as an introduction to our study, let's consider now a little bit about this calling, this calling of God. And when we look at this calling of God, we first need to realize that we are called by the gospel. That is the way in which God calls us. It is not going to be by some still small voice in the night. It's not going to be by some better felt than told experience that we might have. It's not going to be by the Holy Spirit coming into our lives and giving us this warm, fuzzy feeling all over. We're called instead by the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, Paul says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the attaining of, our, of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at that last phrase, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you go back to that which we were just reading in 2 Peter, the first chapter, you see an exact parallel. That here is an abundant entrance ministered into, you, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's obtaining the glory that's in Christ Jesus. Now, how are we going to obtain that? Well, it's by the gospel by which we have been called. And when it says he's called you by our gospel, that word by there showing the means by which he accomplishes it. He accomplishes this calling by means of the gospel. That's the meaning of the phrase by our gospel. And thus, all of these other ways in which we hear about today, they're excluded. That's not how God calls us. It's not how Christ calls us, even though some might think so today. And some will come along with this wild, fanciful tales. 
in which God spoke to them, or they, as uh, Oral Roberts saw, a 50-foot Christ out here, or others uh, who say that God talked to them. One person I asked him, what did he sound like? And he ridiculed the question. Well, I want to know, what did he sound like? If he talked to you, what did his voice sound like? Well, the fact is, he couldn't tell because God hadn't spoken to him in that way. The way God calls us is by the gospel. Now, when we look at that and we start considering, here is we're called by the gospel to this heavenly calling so we can obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ or be ministered unto that abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We start understanding then why that gospel needs to be preached to the unbeliever, to that individual out here who does not believe. What needs to be done? The gospel needs to be preached to him. Jesus, in sending out his apostles with that great commission, Mark 16, 15 and 16, says to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And let me just mention here, when it says he that believeth in verse 16, contextually, it is dealing with the gospel. He that believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. That contextually is what the belief has reference to. Now, don't misunderstand. We're not saying that we don't believe in God and his existence or we don't believe in Christ and his deity. We certainly must. But within what Jesus is stating here, it is belief of the gospel. And we'll mention what that gospel is in a minute, but uh, suffice it to say right now, it's dealing with the fact that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. You must believe that. You must believe the gospel in order to be saved. person who doesn't believe... Well, they will be damned. Now, a lot of times, and when you get into a discussion of baptism for remission of sins, a lot of people will say, well, you didn't talk about the last part of the verse. It's, why doesn't it say, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be saved, or shall be damned? Why doesn't it? Well, it's simple. If you understand, a person is already condemned. All men sin. Come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. That sin separates us from God, Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. And thus we are separated from Him. We are in a state of spiritual death. Because wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23, and James 1, verse 14, 15. That's the state that we are in. We are already damned. Now then, in order to be saved, you have to believe the gospel and you have to be baptized. What if someone doesn't believe? Well, there's no way in which they can be scripturally baptized until after they believe. To go and get dunked in water is not going to be of any value or use to anyone unless there is first a belief. And so it's not the believing not that damns an individual. They're already damned. They're already condemned. They're already going to hell. That doesn't condemn the individual a failure to believe. Neither does a failure to be baptized condemn a person. They're already condemned. That's what saves them. 
be this beginning point of that salvation process is belief. And so there's no need to ask, he that is baptized not shall not shall be damned. They're already condemned, they're already damned, and in order to be saved, you have to believe and be baptized. Person who doesn't believe, they're going to remain in that damned state. That condemned state. And thus there's no use. But many people have used the illustration, he that eats food and digests it will continue to live. He that does not eat food is going to die. Why didn't you add, doesn't digest the food? Because you can't digest food unless you eat it first. It's really pretty simple, isn't it? And that's the exact same type of situation that you have here. But we see that this gospel is to be preached to every creature, every person in the world. Why? Well, Paul would state in Romans 1, 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Here is that gospel of Jesus Christ. That gospel is God's power to save man. That's why it needs to be preached to every creature under heaven. Because it has the power to save their souls. Now, what is that gospel, though? You know, the term gospel is another term that it has that generic and specific use. Gospel very simply means good news, glad tidings. If someone died and left uh, Brother Tim Kozad a million dollars and he got that check tomorrow, he would think that's good news, glad tidings. And he would probably be telling a few people about it. No, he'd be afraid uh, that they might ask him for some money then. <laughs> but it'd still be good news. It's a gospel to him. That's all gospel means, good news, glad tidings. The scriptures then, or the Bible, takes that and uses it in a, in a specialized way, a specific way, dealing with what? How's the Bible using it? Well, we find in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which is preached unto you. Now, no, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to declare unto you the gospel, what it is, what has been preached to you. But notice he deals with this gospel which has been preached unto you which also ye have received. In other words, they had received this. They had accepted it. It was something they did believe. Wherein ye stand. They were living according to it. They stood in it. By which also ye are saved. This gospel is that which saves. That's why it is to be preached, because it's God's power to save. And thus what? Here's that gospel. You received it. You're standing in it. It's going to save you. He puts the condition again, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you believed in vain. Now then, verse 3 and verse 4, he goes on. I have de delivered unto you. Now what did he deliver unto them? Well, verse 1, he says, I've delivered the gospel unto you. I've declared that unto you. I'm declaring what it is now. I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received. And if we had time this morning, we could go back and we could look at Paul's receiving that gospel of Jesus Christ. But study Galatians first chapter verse 10 and 11 in regards to that, or 10 through 12. That which I also received, how that 
Now, and here's what he did, what that gospel is that he's declared. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There's that gospel that Paul declared that he preached unto the Corinthian brethren. It is that death that he died for our sins. The burial of Christ. And how that he rose from the dead the third day. That is according to the scriptures. There's that gospel that has that power to save. And when that gospel is preached, we then learn you and I have to obey it. Man must obey that gospel. In Romans 6, verse 17 and 18. Paul says, would God be thanked that you were the servants of sin? Notice, that was your state. Being a slave, literally the word servant is slave there. Being a slave to sin. Sin had power and had control over you. So that your, was your state. But God be thanked while that was your state. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now what did Paul deliver unto them? The gospel. What was that form of doctrine? Well, it was the what was that doctrine that was delivered? It was that death of Christ, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then, when? Then? Then when? When you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that's when. When you did that. Then you were made free from sin. So you were the servant of sin. You were under servitude. You had sins upon you. Sin had power over your life. But when you obeyed, at that point in time, you were made free from that sin. You're no longer under servitude to it. You're no longer a slave to sin. It no longer has power over you. And you became the servants of righteousness. You've turned your life over to God. But it is when you obeyed that form of gospel, that form of the doctrine. No wonder the Hebrew writer would state that being made perfect, talking about Christ, being made perfect or complete, he became the author of, that word means to bring forth. He is the one who brought forth what? Eternal salvation. That's what he brought forth. He brought forth. He is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. It takes obedience on the part of man in order to have that eternal salvation. If we don't obey, then we don't have it. Now in that obedience is found in the act of baptism. We read just a moment ago, Romans 6, verse 17 and 18, about that form of doctrine that they had to obey in order to be made free from their sin. Well, what is that form of doctrine? When we go back to verse 3 and verse 4, we find that form of doctrine. Remember what that doctrine is that Paul had delivered unto them? How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day? Well, now I notice this form of that doctrine. Romans 6, verse 3 and verse 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There's that form, that likeness, that type of the gospel that man must obey to be made free of sin. That doctrine, that gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. We're baptized into his death. That Christ was buried, buried in that new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. In that act of baptism, we are buried with him by baptism into his death. That Christ was raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. 
that we also should walk in newness of life. We come up out of that grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. There's that form that we obey that's found in baptism. The obedience that we must have. But then the Christian in being called by the gospel is to also live by the gospel. Notice again in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2, and we kind of emphasize this as we read this previously. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye believed in vain. The aspect, you are standing in the gospel, that is indicating that that is the lifestyle that they are now living. They are living according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They keep in mind the death of Christ and how that he died for our sins. They have that gospel within their mind. And because that is in their mind, they are living their lives in light of that gospel and what Christ has done the great love that he has demonstrated for us in the giving of his son and Christ going to that cross so that you and I can be saved. Yes, they were standing in that gospel. They would kept that gospel in their minds so that they would live by it. Everything within their life pointing back to that gospel of Jesus Christ and to bring glory unto God thus. But if we reject it, then we're going to be lost. Paul would write in St. Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through verse 9, that saying it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from his, the glory of his power. Notice, here is Christ is going to come in flaming fire taking vengeance. Those individuals who do not know God and the knowledge of God involves more than just knowing of his existence. As Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17, this is life eternal, that they might know thee and the only true God whom thou hast sent. Or the only, uh, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That's a knowledge of God. But unless one knows God, they're lost. Christ is going to come in flaming fire taking vengeance upon them. But then he adds, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word obey there, in the Greek it's present tense, and thus it means continuous action. One who does not continue to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ that individual Christ is going to come taking vengeance upon that individual. The lifestyle of the individual must be according to the gospel of Jesus Christ or they will suffer eternal vengeance. And thus those who reject that gospel, they're going to be lost. There is no hope for them. They are going to be eternally condemned. And so as we look at that calling, we are called by the gospel. But in relationship to that gospel, there are commands that, are neat, that must be obeyed. That's why Paul says that in uh, Romans 6, and that in verse 17 and 18, how that we were in this condition of being slaves of sin, but we're made free from that sin, and that servitude of sin, when we obey from the heart that form of doctrine. 
It's not just simply going through the actions. It is done with sincerity of heart, knowing what we are doing, understanding that I am having my sins washed away. I'm being made free from that sin. And now then I'm going to live in service to God. There's that obedience from the heart to that form of doctrine. And so there are commands to be obeyed. Those commands have to do with, yes, our knowledge that God is. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. For if you uh, do not have faith, you cannot please God. He that cometh God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We must believe God exists. And yes, we can prove have knowledge that God does exist. God has given us sufficient evidence to know and to come to that proper conclusion. Based upon that, we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Again, God has given us sufficient evidence to come to a conclusion that Jesus of Nazareth, that man who walked this earth 2,000 years ago, that he is the Son of God. God manifested in the flesh, God with us. And thus we come to believe that. Place our trust in Him. We must repent of our sins, turning away from that sinful way. Uh, in the act of baptism, we change the state, but the attitude changes in repentance. We have to change the attitude that we have to being the, from being the servant of sin to having that desire to serve God and to be His servant, to be a servant of righteousness. And so that attitude must change from living according to the ways of this world to living according to the way of God. And then the state has to change. And thus there's the command to be baptized. And that baptism is to change that state from being one who is a servant of sin to one who is freed from his sin. It's that act of salvation. Thus, it is baptism for the remission of our sins, to have those sins taken away or washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, yes, there are commands that are associated with that gospel that we must obey. But then there's promises that are given in relationship to that gospel. We mentioned it here in 1 Corinthians 15. By which also ye are saved. There's the promises that are made in connection with the gospel. We have salvation. In, Matthew, or in Mark 16, 15 and 16, when he tells them the apostles go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized, there's the commands, shall be saved, there's the promise. You want salvation? Believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's the marvelous promises that God gives. The washing away of our sins and the hope of that eternity, if we keep in memory what he has delivered unto us, unless we believed in vain. Then we have that promise of eternal inheritance. If you don't have that promise, though, this morning, then why not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Whether initially to come to Christ and accept the terms that he has set forth, those commands that he has set forth within the gospel, or if you have become a child of God, a Christian, but you haven't continued in obedience to the gospel, you haven't stood within the gospel, come back and tell him to repent of your sins and once again be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if public sin is upon your life and public confession of wrong and letting us pray with you for the forgiveness of it, if you need to come this morning, we would encourage you to do so as we stand and sing that invitation song.